Hello, hello. Hey, Ed, how's it going? Long time no see. I know, you don't write, you don't call. <laughs> Cole, it's been so long you grew a beard on me. Yeah, yeah. How was the, um, how was the response to that Git Bomb meeting? It went really well. The meeting itself went well. Um, I'm actually in the process of marshalling out an email pointing to the meeting minutes to the mailing list. Um, we're getting good traction on the Slack channel, including a bunch of folks wandering in. Uh, we got lots of good responses to the initial tweet. Um, so, you know, we're, we're sort of getting traction. It looks like the, one of the more challenging things at this point is going to be sort of balancing email people versus Slack people in terms of keeping the communications flowing. Um, we've got a couple folks who brought up tools at the, the community meeting uh, the various pocks have been in progress apparently, and they're, they're sort of rough and ready, but, um, they're trying to sort of get some of them out. Um, I, I've got some on my end where I'm clearing them through our open source process to get them out. So yeah, hitting the ground running. Good. Yeah. It's exciting. I think, uh, you know, we got a little bit of work to do on the explaining exactly what it does. It seems, but that will come in time, right? We got to figure oh, out and, what it is first. Well, and, and dear God, like any help on that would be very welcome. Cause you know, <clears throat> what I've learned over the years is that, that, that one way of explaining, th there's no one true way of explaining a thing. It's, it's many different ways of explaining it that help everyone understand. Mm -hmm. So I haven't been to these lately. Is uh, Andre still leading it or what's going on? There, we would have gotten Michael in here. Ah, oh, there's Brandon. Hey, what's going on, Brandon? Brandon B. Brandon. It's going to be complicated. <laughs> Two of us aren't allowed to be in the same place at the same time. One of us has to go. <laughs> hey, Emina. A little light, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, this, uh, they don't allow Zoom on my work laptop anymore, so it's browser hell all the time. Mm. <laughs> all right. I think today should be released there, right? We should be, we should be ready for, for public comment. <laughs> At least that was the plan. Let me open up the document. Okay, I think Michael should be coming on soon. Um, I know Andreas is, is out. Let's give it a, give it a bit. Sorry there about that. Hey, Michael. Hey. <clears throat> uh, I guess we can get started. Um, so, uh, did we already go through the the whole spiel yet, or are you going to? Wait, no, I was, I was waiting for you. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Just as a reminder. Um, uh, you know, this meeting falls under the CNCF's code of conduct. Um, and also this meeting will be uh, recorded and will be put up on YouTube. Uh, so a couple of quick sort of updates here. Um, we're, so uh, as 
we had the big push last week to sort of uh, refactor the document. Um, and we did a lot of great work on that. We took it down from 52, 53 pages down to like about 33 pages and, and without actually really removing any valuable content, mostly just trying to either push um, specific details that are not really related to the architecture, either citing them to the best practices uh, paper or just putting that in supplementary material uh, or you know linking to supplementary material. So now, um, and as, as you know, uh, Celeste, as many of you know, Celeste is no longer at the CNCF, so she's not reviewing the paper a second time, but we do have uh, somebody who should be reviewing the paper. I'm gonna try and follow up with them uh, shortly. Um, well, so Michael, I think, I think if we, uh, we should wait probably for, do the RFC and then do the okay. second review, yeah. Yeah, sounds good to me. Um, so maybe you and I can sync up after this meeting just to kind of, I don't remember all the exact details of of uh, how to um, make that statement and, and make sure yeah. that it's it's all good. Um, but yeah, that, that, cool. Uh, so yeah, so um, and then while that's going on, yeah, Nate Wadding will eventually come in and, and give a second sort of um, pass through of the paper. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's about it let me just double check to see if there's anything else on that front um no uh any other updates otherwise we can hand it over to to cole for a demo i don't have an update but i have a request on the doc but i'll wait for updates all I know it's mostly just been the doc stuff, so and we've kind of already gone through that. So if there's no updates, uh, yeah, Brendan. Yeah, so so uh, I see that kind of like still like some edits here and there, at least on the on the doc. Um, is there something that we still need to discuss as a group, or is this um, all the edits kind of minor things that we think we can, you know? We can just go through, accept everything, and then be ready for RFC. Uh, let me just double check and look through here. I think most of these are stuff we've already addressed and should probably kind of figure out, or you know, they're they're relatively minor. Okay. I think. okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then then we can figure. We can just go through these offline, and then we will we'll get it. We'll get RFC started, and everyone should um, retweet it to your friends and all your network. Yeah, I'm just gonna accept. Uh, there was a couple of Alex Floyd Marshall's things, which were just some last minute cleanups, which I forgot to. Uh, okay, click the button on. Yeah, and we may end up creating a copy of the document for RC for permission yep. issues. Um, so just take note of that in case you, you're looking at the wrong document. Yeah, I think that's it for me. So cool, all yes. All right, well, thank you all very much. I know uh, Mikhail and I haven't been to a lot of these working groups lately, but we've been really busy writing a lot of code. Um, so we're excited to kind of show you what we've been working on over the past few months. Uh, we've recently uh, released Witness uh, under uh, open source Apache 2.0 license. Uh, there's a GitHub repo um, at github.com testify slash witness where everything's available. <clears throat> so let me get my slide deck up and kind of tell you what we're going to be doing. I think some of y'all know what um, we've been working on, but we'll, we'll be thorough here. <clears throat> all right, so really what we're doing with Witness is we're creating a framework for an attestation-based security model, all right? And I got this little artifact here from the Salsa website, right? So your, your artifacts, you create attestations for those artifacts, right? You can feed those into a policy engine and feed your policy into that policy engine. And on the other side, you get a decision. Um, so this is where we are at with Witness right now. We've implemented this um, as a CLI tool and as a library. 
Um, so that library can be implemented in any number of uh, downstream tools. Uh, right now, we're working on an emission controller, um, which is probably the most, uh, the, the, the easiest use case here. So how do we actually do this, right? So um, any piece of evidence um, that we have along our uh, uh, software de delivery lifecycle can be attested to. In this image, I'm showing about commits, uh, static testing, build, automated testing, right? We can create attestations for all those. The other thing too, is we can create attestations for just about anything, right? Um, in an enterprise environment, we have a lot more things that we have to worry about when we bring that software into that production environment, right? We wanna know where's the country of origin for the company that made it, right? We wanna know, uh, the background financials for that company and a bunch of other things. Those are also things that we can bring in to uh, create attestations about and bring it into the decision cycle, the automated decision cycle. And that way we only have verified software that makes it into the execution environment. We know that it's only verified because we actually have a policy that's cryptographically signed that says, hey, make sure that these attestations exist and these attestations have certain attributes or selectors on them uh, that we, we, we select. Um, so what does that actually look like in practice? Actually, I'm going to go over to the GitHub repo and kind of talk about this life cycle here. We'll talk about the attestation life cycle first. Uh, so we've separated these attestors into two separate categories. We have our pre-attestors and we have our post-attestors. Uh, the material command run and product attestors, those are internal attestors uh, to the framework. Right, and they run in a defined order. The pre-attesters always run before the command run, and the post-attesters always run after, right? So that way with the pre-attesters, we can collect information about the environment, right? Maybe there's a TPM that we wanna get some selectors off of or AWS metadata, and we create an attestation off of that. And then the material tester goes in and collects everything within that context that you select. Right, and calculates the shashams off of that and makes it available, you know, within that attestation context of the other testers. Then we pass all that context down to the command run a tester. The command run a tester is what we actually wrap the process that you specify with, right? So that allows us to do a lot of special things. Uh, we have some alpha tracing support uh, that we collect every file, intermediate file, every 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 syscall, right? That that that. Uh, process makes, we can grab and inspect and record uh, and create an attestation on. That's pretty pretty early right now. We have some basic support for that. So then we go into our product tester, right? Anything that didn't exist in that context beforehand uh, will now be considered a product and, and we'll calculate the shots on off of that and calculate the MIME type, pass that down to the post tester uh, where we can then uh, make an attestation and normalize any of that output data, right? Um, so one of the big things we like about these attestors is they actually normalize all this test data or all this output data in a way that's really easy to create a policy over it. Um, so once we get all those attestations, we bundle them together in what we call an attestation collection, and we shove them into an envelope, and we sign that envelope. Right now, the envelope that we support is D, uh, DSSE, uh, really easy to use. Uh, and for key providers, we support file type key providers, as well as Spiffy Spire key providers, right? We're going to have more support for different key providers uh, in the future. So then we get all that, sign it, and then we push it to a store. We support two stores right now, Recore and a file-based store. Uh, now, Recore is really special because we actually get a timestamp um, on that envelope when we store it in Recore, which means that our key provider can issue short-lived certificates to that envelope because we can validate um, that, that that envelope was signed uh, while those keys are actually valid. So that gives us a little bit of a better trust model when we actually use Recore. Um, we'll pause there. Any questions? All right. And then I will switch over to my terminal. Uh, so what we're going to actually do is uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create some keys. Actually, we'll do that. So let's create some keys. Uh, 
Then we're going to do an actually create program. That looks like it should work. All right, and then we're going to actually look at that dot witness dot yaml. So, uh, in total, uh, doesn't support a config file. We thought this would be make it a little bit easier to drop into a uh, uh, CI repo. Um, so you can see we're looking for when we do a witness run, we're looking for that private key test key pam, and for the verify, we're looking for the public key test pub pam. Great. So then let's actually go build that app with witness. Oh, so. All right, so now we have an actual attestation. All right, so it's a DSE, DSSE, DSSE envelope. Um, so the next thing we need to do is actually create a policy. Um, so I'm gonna go Vim. All right, you can see uh, the functionaries right here. We have this public key ID. Um, and then right here, this is actually the keys that are gonna sign the attestation. Right now we're overloading the keys for this demonstration and using the same keys to sign the policy as the same key to sign the actual attestations, right? In an enterprise environment, these are scopes that generally be separated. Uh, so this is where you would define the public key for Thing that's signing the attestations or right with our certificate constraint support that we've added right we actually use a certificate authority and constrain the functionaries based upon that which works really great if uh, we're using something like a spiffy id and that way we can issue these identities based upon the actual workload that's making that build happen um, you can see we put those in right there we've got those templated out because i got this little said script i'll make this a lot easier uh, Cole, quick question for in the policy. I saw you had these. Um, I, I, are you going to do that now? I was looking at the the top part. So do you kind of do half the different attestations as different objects that you're treating them as? Yeah. So if you look at these policies, it, and I'll show you what happens when we change this a little bit later on the demo. But right. So. Okay. Each of these attestations has a namespace and a type and a version to it, right? So this is this is what we found was really the big issue with with uh, like trying to analyze test data and we're just shoving it out to some Elasticsearch, right? It's not normalized and we can't create policy in any, in any meaningful way um, unless we have that data normalized. That's why you're seeing all these solutions up that are like taking AI engines that try to ingest this data and just come up with a solution, whether it's good or bad, right? We're not doing that here. We're actually normalizing the data, creating policy on that actual data. These, these uh, attestations type, when we go to dig to the code in a second, you'll see that those line up with the actual attestations that, that we're fill, feeding into the, the factory. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Looking forward to seeing that. Okay. So next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna sign that policy. Uh, right. So, and then this policy is the gatekeeper to wherever you are deploying this workload, right? So this is going to be like your CISO for your enterprise that says, okay, let me look at this, make sure it meets what our organizational policy is. They're going to stick in the hardware token and they're going to sign it, right? So we got that signed. Now we can actually do a verification uh, using the built-in uh, CLI verification, right? We can see we have an exit zero, so that works. Um, now let's take a look and see actually what it looks like when we push it to record too. I'll add a, now I got a record server running. Now I think these attestations already exist in there. No, they don't, which is great. 
And then we can do uh, witness verify and pray to the demo gods. All right, works great. Um, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna actually change our policy. Right, so we're gonna say, oh, look at this. So we wanna make sure that everything that is verified that passes verification is actually built on a GCP cluster, right? And we can actually lock this down to this, like any of the metadata that's available in that GCP issue. Uh, but we're actually not gonna dive into the Rego policy quite yet in this demo. All right. GCP IT. Now we signed it, so we need to actually redo it. Now we can do the witness verify. Right. And so we can see. Right, we didn't have an attestation that said this was actually built on our approved cluster GCP. So this artifact will never make it into our production as long as we have this policy in place. Does that make sense? Yep. Cool. Um, and I think that is the end of this demo. Let me dig into the code. I can kind of show you. Oh, come on, you stupid Zoom. Stop share. So, what we really like about this, and what, what Mikhail uh, kind of designed, um, I wish you were here to talk about it a little bit, but you couldn't make it today. Um, if you go to the package, the attestation, you can kind of see this is our secret sauce. All of these are really compostable. There's this factory that registers these attestations um, at runtime. So you get to select what attestations you want to use. And they're really easy to actually put together. Uh, so we're looking at like this GCP IIT. Um, I shamelessly stole some of this code from uh, the Spiffy Spire project, um, uh, but you know, within you know two two hundred fifty lines of code, I was able to write this a tester that kind of just hitting some APIs, and then you know we're collecting that data, normalizing it, and then putting it down that attestation pipeline. You can verify it at any point. What you see here, we go on top right. We have our name. So this, this was run, that witness build was actually run on a GCP instead of my own local machine, right? We would have had that metadata available to validate it against and that, that policy would have, would have passed. I guess I have a quick question on like um, the, let's say using GCP build, right? How, do you, how are you right now doing the key material and passing it around? Uh, for the key material. So what we're doing is we're just validating that JWT. Uh, we're expecting okay. signing that attestation is that's where your trust model comes from, right? So that might be some uh, enterprise PKI system. Um, okay. out, could be, you know, maybe you're using uh, in the future, we'd have a plugin for vault where you get your keys from vault, right? or maybe you're using the TPM on there. I, I think there's a different bunch of different ways we can do that key provider, but those are providing that trust for that node, right? And then what we're doing is we're layering these security attestations on top of it. But where the trust model breaks down is if we're just trusting that node and then creating these attestations without some sort of outside verification. Um, it's still better than nothing, right? It gets us at that salsa level one because we're recording the metadata. But in order to actually get to that salsa level three, four, we need that uh, node verification. Um, right here, we're doing, I think we're doing workload verification just because we're recording everything about that workload, just because we're not verifying it necessarily, or uh, let me back up a second. 
because none of this is actually hitting production environment right now, these are not actually running workloads. I, it's sufficient enough just to collect enough metadata to actually do the verification at a later point. We don't need to actually do the workload verification at this point, right? We can do the workload verification at execution time just because we're not actually in a production environment. Gotcha. All right. I have a question. Policies are uh, Rego policies could be Q or many other, or is that part uh, something that you can plug in different uh, systems for the policy enforcement? Right. So we chose Rego for two reasons. One is in our enterprise version, we want to support external policy to integrate with, uh, you know, things like Styrodas and Open Policy Agent. Uh, it works really well there. Um, also, Rego, one thing we hear from our customers is that they really want to get a reason for a policy rule denial, right? Just say, hey, this policy failed is, is generally too opaque uh, to actually get any good debugging going. So Rego allows us to actually give that policy denial reason. Uh, we've designed the data, the, the schema in a way that it's really easy to add additional policy types to it. Uh, and we think that that Q is definitely something that we can use to simplify the, the policy creation in the future. Okay, good. Another question is this uh, kind of, I mean, witness can also be used as a dependency, like, like a library, right? That you can, you need to use only the CLI or or at this point is, is uh, modular enough to, to just call certain functions or interfaces? Yeah, yeah, there's public facing functions that you're free to use. Uh, we're going to, I mean, we're going to do, we're at version 0.1 right now. So, I mean, you're, I don't know how much is going to change, but we're really going to try to keep that goal compatibility unity with our public facing API right now. Um, in fact, I'm, there's some stuff I think we got to work through still a little bit, um, but I am actually building an admission controller with that library right now. So I think once I get a little bit further on that, um, that API might be a little more stable. Well, as, as we just use it internally here, with we'll some of the stuff we're doing. Thank you. Yeah, I can actually show you what this attestation looks like too. And kind of get an idea what the policy you can create on them is. Um, so what we have is we have these in total statements, and we have every attester has these things called subjects that they they emit. And anything that you create a subject on, we can is indexed by Recore. We can go ahead and look that up. Uh, so we can see we can now look up. Uh, this artifact by the actual commit hash uh, that was made because uh, that's in the get a tester and we can also look it up by this fi file hash right here. Um, so if we search Rico for any of these two things, this will come up. Um, so like in the GCP IIT a tester, right, we, we have uh, like uh, similar stuff like that that we can look it up by. We record the entire environment metadata. We know that, okay, uh, we have a get this get a tester, so we know that this build actually had uh, some untracked uh, changes or un unstaged changes. So we can create policy against this and say, hey, make sure that your your get tree is clean uh, for anything you build, and if that that so that way that doesn't make it into production. And then we have the material tester here, right? That's just grabbing everything that's in that uh, context and bringing it in. And then this is our command run a tester. Um, now this is running in non-tracing mode. And then our product tester, right? We have the MIME type for the output and the SHA-256, right? And then this, this is available 
to any POSA testers too. So this is kind of, this is what we use in our OCI tester is, hey, we have a tar file that was output from a Docker save. Uh, so let's open that up and just calculate all the metadata and, and then push, then index that and create an attestation about that uh, to record. Actually, we'll do a Oops, that looks better. And actually when we put tracing on, um, we can see we got every single, we can see actually what program use, was used to compile it, the SHA sum of that program, as well as all the information, right? We even see that, hey, uh, my machine, I have the spec bypass vulnerability, um, I, I, I don't have that turned on right now. So I need a little more performance because it's my own personal machine. So we can create policy even on stuff like that. Um, once we start doing some more inspection of uh, using S-Trace. All right, so we know every single file that went into this compiler. Um, I know Ed, Ed's been doing some work uh, around, the, around some of this stuff, getting this information into the actual ELF files too. But anyways, I think that's all we have uh, for witness. So if anyone's got any questions and uh, I'm here, here uh, until the end of the time. I definitely wanna thank you for sharing this. I've been following it you know, from your breadcrumbs over, over time and happy to see it finally open source. So thanks for sharing. Thank you very much. I know this is probably for for uh, you know uh, further down the line, but I, I'd be curious to know like what thoughts you might have around um, either witness sort of managing the sandbox for things that it's going to be wrapping, or or where you see sort of that kind of coming together. Do you see that as like, hey, we would recommend that witness let's say wraps a um, trusted build process. And that trusted build process does a lot of the sandboxing and witness is more or less just sort of acting as the, um, the tool to sort of record all that information. Or do you see witness as being the thing that does the sandboxing? Um, I don't want to do, well, so I think we can do some sandboxing, but it's not, it's not, it's for better recording of materials in and out. Right. I think if we, you know, spin this into its own namespace, uh, there's some benefits there um, as far as recording, re having more accurate recordings of what's going on. Um, whether that's gonna help with sandboxing, yeah, probably, but that's really not the point and that's not what we wanna do, right? With witness, what we really wanna do is put as many sensors into this build process as possible. That way, you know, when we have an unknown unknown in our build system, we probably will have the metadata we need to mitigate against that situation, right? And this is what we really looked at. You know, you look at Heartbleed, right? If we had a witness uh, metadata for every single build into that, that happened with Heartbleed, right? We'd be able to mitigate that very quick. Um, there's a demo in the repo. I'm not gonna go through it right now, but it shows how we can use this information uh, to mitigate it against Log4j. We have a Maven attester that you know, creates attestations based upon and indexes based upon Maven packages that are in that context, right? Um, so once we start layering all this stuff together and you create, you know, your custom attesters for whatever environment that's specific to your needs, right? I, I think it solves a lot of those problems. Did that answer your question, Mike? Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, def no, definitely answers. A question. Cool. I think I saw one more hand. Brandon, were you asking a question? 
No, it's just clapping. Oh, okay. <laughs> I love the level of measurements. I have to say, uh, you know, I think this is this is the more detail is, is very interesting to what we can do for policy. Yeah, and that's one of the things, right? I think there's going to be different levels of detail for different organizations. There's obviously a cost, right? I think when we when we ran witness against a Linux kernel build, the attestation ended up being like 600 megabytes. So maybe that's not the best. But, but right, we can create attestation of an attestation to kind of reduce that down a little bit. There's things we can do around that, um, but just having that information available to whatever workflow you want, I, I think is important. Because what we've done is we've effectively moved the policy enforcement point outside of the CI pipeline to wherever you want to put it. And that decouples all these, all these little things that were tightly coupled to the CI pipeline, now are not. Now this lets us create uh, trusted pipelines between different infrastructures it allows us to create uh, trusted pipelines between different organizations, right? Because we have different roots of trust that we can validate it against. So it really allows you to uh, decompose your uh, software de delivery lifecycle and create policy around that. Yeah, I think policy is one of the things that, that we kind of keep going back into at least, you know, in, in some of the discussions I'm having is like, yeah, we have all this information, but don't really know what to do about it. Oh, it's not in the format which is consistent um, that we can make um, clean policies or, or sensible policies out of. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the work done with Intoto is really the foundation for this, right? Where well, there's an implementation in total specs. So having that normalized data using those defined predicate types, you know, for example, that GCP IIT type, I think really help helps with that problem, Brandon. Yeah, this is awesome. See. Thank you. Awesome. And, and in case I missed uh, something, I, I would love to kind of um, chat at, at some point over like uh, just sort of thinking through some of this, like if, if um, right, like if, witness, if the build process that witness is wrapping, right, if, if it's still run under the same user with the same permissions, wouldn't it be able to potentially access the memory from witness and like, you know, start poking around? <laughs> Like it, it, yeah, I, I... It, it is. You're right, but that's why we have to have external trust to that build node, right? Either through yep. a remote attestation using Spiff Expire, which is our current trust model. Uh, the other way you could do it is have like uh, something like Falco running that node and have a good Falco rule set for witness, because now you've identified where what process space your build's running in, so it makes it a lot easier to create, uh, you know, runtime policy against it. Oh, there's one more side effect I forgot to mention. Uh, when you when you run S trace on a uh, on a process, nothing else can actually run S trace on it. Uh, so there's a demo, and it, I mean, for people that actually know how it works, it's not that impressive. Uh, but it actually, when you run trace on this build process, you mitigate the exact attack vector that was used in the Solar Winds attack. Now maybe they could use BPF, right? We're not analyzing a lot of the files yet, and stuff. We don't know. If that would work against it quite yet, but I know that if an attacker tries to use S-Trace, it will completely block uh, any privilege escalation. And we have a demo that, that shows that. Yeah, that's, uh, I think a few of the other tools out there, um, like your, your Falcos and, and, and whatnot also do that same sort of thing is like, if you open, if you just leave sort of an, you know, if you're not even doing anything with the S-Trace, if you just sort of leave that connection open, then nobody else can try and... <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, that, we can yeah. do it without we can do it without any elevated permissions, right? I didn't run sudo for any of this stuff um, because we're wrapping that process. 
we have full permissions over that process. So this runs perfectly well in a container. Uh, this compiles, you know, runs on ARM. This will pretty much run anywhere. Um, as long as, like, if you have a redirect because you're doing like a Docker build over a, over a socket, right? We don't we don't trace that yet. I think there's way to, ways to do it, but we don't know if we're going to. Um, but yeah, as long as it's a sub process and we don't we don't have any external calls, we'll we'll tra track everything and all the sub process from that sub process, all the way down the tree. Yeah, any other uh, questions, comments, concerns? All right, well, thank you, Cole. Um, just to reiterate to, to anybody who sort of, I noticed a couple of folks had joined a little um, later in the um, so as a reminder, the, the, the ref arc doc is, um, is gonna be going out for a uh, request for comment from the community. Uh, hopefully soon, uh, once uh, I figure out, uh, I'm going to be working with Brandon after this meeting, just to kind of get that all uh, sorted out, and it should be going out. Um, as a reminder from last time, uh, you know, we brought down the the paper from like 52 or 53 pages or so down to like 32, 33 pages, which is in a, a much uh, better spot. Um, we didn't delete any, you know, useful content, but we just let's just said, hey, specific details. We really want folks to look at best practices paper and other sorts of supplementary material. We want folks to just sort of mostly focus on the high level uh, architecture in this, this document. Um, so that information will also be going out to the, um, the community as part of the ref, uh, request for comment. And then the other thing, just as a reminder, you know, uh, uh, so Celeste who was doing the review um, has left the CNCF and um, somebody else will be joining on uh, to uh, Nate Waddington will be uh, also reviewing the paper as we kind of after the request for comment and, and all that sort of stuff is over. And so that's all the updates on the, um, the ref arc uh, side. Um, yeah, any other sorts of things uh, regarding, you know, any other, um, any questions, comments, uh, any topics that they want to discuss, any topic that they think would be useful for next week, any demos in upcoming weeks or anything like that? Yeah, so I think we added a little bit of the agenda just to sort of call out, right? we'd come past, oh. um, <clears throat> we had come back past uh, this group before talking about Git. And so the Git bomb community has actually finally launched. There's sort of a lot of, of milling about chatting with folks, making sure that, that, you know, it made sense to a bunch of people. Um, and so I've stuck into the agenda some links to the, you know, launch announcement, the Git, the Git bomb website. Um, you know, someone quite embarrassingly on Twitter produced a really good succinct explanation. Uh, it's always embarrassing when people tweet threads that are better than your, your concerted attempts. <laughs> um, <clears throat> But um, I don't know how many folks remember when we came through to discuss GitBomb prior, um, but it's effectively a very simple scheme to allow you to have your build tools build a compact artifact tree for what they've just built and essentially embed a unique uh, identifier into the resulting artifacts being built. And we've actually got some interest from folks in various language communities in incorporating this because it's small enough and simple enough that it actually makes sense in a compiler or linker. Uh, sort, of, sort of just by way of comparison and, and all bad props code here, Cole, what we're doing is much simpler than what you're doing, but I've got a little bit of pop tooling I'm trying to drive out from where I'm sitting to the open source right now that we've run against the Linux kernel and where you were getting 600 megabytes of total data out, um, we were winding up with like 824K. Um, now, admittedly, you're doing a lot more, um, <laughs> but... yeah. To, to jump in and be clear, like this is just the artifact tree, no signing, attestations, none of that. So it's perfectly compatible with something like Witness that could produce this. Um, oh, absolutely. In, in fact, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very complementary technology to what Witness is doing. Yeah, yeah having that common data format to, uh, to, to describe the artifact tree will be very useful. I think it's something we're looking for. So and excellent time. I think the other pieces of GitBomb is enabling to chain between 
different build processes. Like if something is implemented witness in one step and that artifact is then consumed in the next build step and that one's a different project, different language doesn't use witness. As long as they all use the same Git bomb identifier format, it can all chain together. And, and hopefully by driving this out into the, the various sort of primary build tools like compilers and linkers and those sorts of things, it becomes something that's just sort of ubiquitously there that developers don't have to think about. Um, because developers, you know, the, the run of the mill developer is not nearly as excited about instrumenting their lives as we are. <laughs> yeah, so we just wanted to show up and say, hey, it's actually launched. There are now community meetings and a website. Um, mailing lists, channels. Mailing lists. Yeah, we'd love for folks to join, show up, tell your friends, uh, bring a dish to the, the picnic, you know, whatever. Awesome. I think it could be uh, interesting. Maybe we should add this to our related groups as well on the, the tax security yeah, yeah. page. Yeah, we should do that. And Ed, once you have some of that, I know you you mentioned some of the the you want to show uh, hoping to open source a few things. Um, once once you do, definitely um, uh, love to uh, yeah <laughs> see see more of that. <laughs> there well, I, there I, is I, already I, an open source implementation in Go. Frederick's one. Yeah, Frederick's. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I, I I'm going through that embarrassing process where you realize that people don't tell you things inside your own company because I keep tripping across people who've been doing various pieces of POC work, but now I'm trying to, to shunt towards the open source and what is sort of a, a pseudo instrumentation uh, to sort of give you something to kick the tires with before we get things into compilers. I apparently have someone working on LLVM and Clang, which I didn't even know about. Um, so. Well, that's, ha that's what happens when you have uh, a huge company. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it's, it's, it's sort of like there was a there's a Twitter thread about somebody who was running an OSPO office, uh, the open source project office, discovering that there were three orgs for their company they didn't even know about. And, and I've been doing this for 20 years and, and I'm past the point where I'm even, I'm not even, it's not even that I'm not shocked. I'm not even concerned when you discover that things like this are happening. <laughs> Cool. Um, so if there's uh, nothing else, then we can uh, give everybody back, what is it, 12 minutes. Awesome. All right. cool. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.